And the person seeking company will feel the attachment of love. This is Bible's from the previous line. Look, you seek company, then you'll feel love. And this love is followed immediately by pain. Uh, I don't know how you do that with your psychotherapist, but a good psychotherapist is one of the things he or she tries to promote is love. In fact, I have a hard time with the contemporary Buddhist use of the word detachment because human beings need attachment. I can't imagine anybody being practicing Buddhism and be happy with it if they have no attachment when they're little children, right? If your mother didn't hold you in her arms and gave you lots of attachment, you wouldn't be able to be a healthy monk, okay? So be careful with that. So, brings pain and perceiving the mystery born from love, wander alone like the glasses. Feeling sympathy for a dear friend, the mind is bound. Notice that sympathy for a dear friend is bad. It binds the mind, it ties the mind. And then when he lets the goal and perceiving the danger from him, you were right, it was going to happen. <laughs> it had to just be done the time. Just say. He didn't seem to be for a dear friend, the mind bound when he lets the goal and perceiving the danger from the intimacy, wonder along. Like an entwined growth of bamboo stalks is concerned for children and wife. Like a bamboo sprout, unattached, unentangled, wandering along like the rhinoceros. Okay. This is one of perhaps one of the most extreme expressions of this ascetic view. However, the ascetic view has another side, and this is where we begin to see that it's not totally crazy to talk about mindfulness in a Buddhist sense. That Come close to what the psychologist is doing. But by the same thing, it comes close. In this particular passage, which is one of my favorites, well, actually, the whole Sudan Father is my favorite, but uh, I have a problem because I'm supposed to be a specialist in Mahayana, and I often teach Mahayana at the Dharma centers. I like the population more. <laughs> <laughs> so I try to so put it you know, under the table. But anyway, it seems to be much more accurate, much more to the point. Tell me, O Gautama says, this is from the Atakavara, possibly the oldest who says. Tell me, O Gautama, how is it that one goal can quickly calm, see things, and how does he behave? And then we reply, one who before the breakdown of his body is already free from craving, thirst, and who does not rely on the past or the future, and does not build up the present, he holds no preferences. Notice how the interval is clear, very ascetic point. Is there some kind of occurrence? Back there? And you can see here. Back there. Okay. And notice that it's talking about the beginning of craving, but then slides into something that's very important. And that comes closer to the idea of mindfulness as non-judgmental observation. That is, you have no past or future or present. And this is actually crucial for mindfulness therapy. Why? Because so-called, I like to call them complex not disorders. Complaints because no one complains to you because it's just bothered me healthy, right? Complaints. Complaints such as depression or depressive states are often associated with something called rumination in English. Rumination means to turn around. It's very common. Patients are telling me, my mind turns. Right? And that happens because you sort of project yourself to the future or to the past and forget the present. And the value of mindfulness, understood just simply by yourself, observing without judgment, is that it places you at a point that is really neither past, nor future, nor present. You have no dimension, right? It's just every single instant. Notice how that makes that kind of mindfulness slightly different from Shabda Vipassana, okay? I like to compare uh, that sort of mindfulness to 
to the way the airplane or boat travels. I know you like boats or airplanes. I love airplanes. In fact, I love small airplanes because they're shaped enough. Okay. And one of the things is an airplane never travels in a straight line. Next time you get into airplanes and worrying about whether it's going to crash or not, concentrate on that and enjoy the joys of aerial navigation. Okay. The airplane moves like this. And if it wants to go over there, it'll go like this. But eventually it'll go over there, right? So the mind can do that. In other words, the mind can follow the topsy turviness of this inner space. But if it follows it with a point ahead all the time, the point ahead, of course, is breathing, then it will navigate. It will not stop, and it will shake, but it will navigate and eventually get to the point of us again. That's my favorite example for that. Start with Buddhist test, my favorite. If you find the Buddhist test, you call me anytime. <laughs> when you are in a 747, the thing is, um, the idea that is here there's a shift in the way that the ascetic renouncement is presented. He is not addicted to pleasurable tastes, not even to pride, soft spoken, but eloquent and alert. These are all moral qualities, right? Again, something you would not find in psychotherapy practice, that's a religious practice. And then he says, observing with equanimity, upekha, mindful, sako, which is smurta, smurta. He does not see anyone in this world as equal, superior, or inferior, and he is not swollen with pride. This is really a joke because it contains the idea of what you have to do observe with upekha, which really is equanimity, even by Observe them, mindful, you follow them in your mind, you make them present, and then you realize there's no such thing as a superior and inferior or unequal. Doesn't make any sense in that state of mind. So far, you can say, well, this is the curve of a good mindfulness therapy. But then he says, he's not so good with pride, and then he's not the moral cards, right? And this is crucial because there's a big difference between the two systems. You're here in the case of Buddhism trying to accomplish a particular kind of moral person. This is very different from just alleviating suffering. Needless to say, in real practice, it's not like that. There are many studies that have been done that have shown that psychotherapists in the psychotherapy room don't follow the theory. And those are good therapists, right? They adapt to some of the And the theory becomes irrelevant. Oh, I am psychodynamic, right? And then they describe what they do and it's not psychodynamic. Right? I have patients with whom I start with uh, behavior, cognitive behavioral therapy. You know what? They don't want to hear about it. It doesn't work for them. So you change, right? Change. Okay. Now, just one more example of how, in the Buddhist context, this mindful observation can lead to certain things that you would never say in psychotherapy. Consider as something that you would teach or you could educate your patient. Not only that, but things that we have problems with from our point of view, at least my point, of what mental health is. And this is from the Mahasamipata Sutta. He says, a monk reflects on this very body. This is, of course, of course Kaya. Delta Sati, right? This is observation of the body. Which, in mindfulness therapy, you simply observe what the body is feeling. You observe it, that's it. But notice how different this is. You observe the body from the soles of the feet on up and from the crown of the head on down, surrounded by skin and full of various kinds of clean things. And the body work, the supa, is something more than unclean, it's disgusting things. Okay. And you think then, it tells you what to think also, which is so different, right? In this body, there are flesh, tendons, bones, bone marrow, kidneys, heart, 
liver, pleura, spleen, lungs, large intestines, small intestines, feces, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, and that goes on. In fact, this kind of practice is known as absurd and disgusting. Now, it has a 